So Anissa explained the importance of psychosis to, uh, of, of increased dopamine in the striatum to psychosis, and in particular, the abnormality in the associative or cognitive part of the striatum, and how this is associated with psychotic symptoms uh, relatively specifically. And what we mean by psychotic symptoms are the experiences that the patients have, like hearing voices that are not there, that other people can't hear, or having false delusional thoughts. Um, but we don't know exactly how you get from uh, the alteration, the increased dopamine in the striatum, to these sort of experiences. And so how, how, how do you go from you have more dopamine in the striatum and then you suddenly hear a voice? How do you connect the dots there? So those are the type of questions that motivate my research, which I started under the mentorship of Anis Abidargam, and I continue to pursue in my lab. So to take a step back, we need to understand something about perception. How do, how, what types of information do we integrate into our experience of the world? And um, do healthy people perceive just things that are out there in reality, in, in objectively? Or do we perceive things in a distorted way? Do we perceive things that are not there necessarily? So to illustrate this point, I'm gonna ask you to look at the center of the screen for about 20 seconds. Look carefully at the center. Just a bit longer. Okay. So, <laughs> probably in, in the transition, probably when it transitioned from the, those uh, moving circles to, to the picture, you probably saw some motion, right? And this, this motion was never there. This was always a still static picture. So this illustrates several points. One of them is that perception is subjective in that all of us can perceive things that are not there. Uh, and part of that subjectivity comes from the expectations that we form or that our brain forms based on the context. In this case, there were these moving circles that provided some context. We expected for that motion to continue, and then when we transitioned to something that was still, our brain generated this illusion that there was still motion, right? It also illustrates another point, which is that there are errors in perception that are not necessarily indicative of any pathology. All of us have them. And indeed, I can go into details, but they actually suggest that the brain optimally integrates different sources of information. So this is not necessarily a bad thing, and it's actually a good thing in many contexts. So this is not just a subjective phenomenon. There's a brain basis for this. So for instance, when you're listening to my voice right now, uh, we know quite a bit of what parts of the brain, what circuits are processing this information. And we know that there's a part of the brain here in the auditory cortex, in so-called voice selective regions of the auditory cortex, that are being activated right now when you hear my voice. And we know that something like this happens also when patients are hallucinating voices. So they're experiencing voices that other people can't hear, but they tell us, yeah, I'm hearing this voice. So what happens during those periods is that there's increased uh, metabolism, increased activity in uh, those parts of the auditory cortex, very similar parts. This is with a, a PET measure of metabolic activity. And we also see that with functional magnetic resonance imaging. We see that there's engagement in this same regions that are voice selective when the person tells us that they're hearing speech, but we know there's no real stimulus there. So that begs the question of how is information being processed in these regions of the brain? So we have done a number of experiments to, to look at that question. And as I mentioned before, we think that expectations play a, a big role in how the information is being processed. So to simplify things a little bit, what we know is that uh, when you're listening to one voice, for instance, or one uh, have some sensory event, we know that not all of those events are equal. And your brain encodes them in a way that depends on how surprising or how unexpected they are. As if um, redundant and predictable information is not as important and the brain doesn't engage as much during uh, processing of that information. And when there's some information that is very new and completely unpredictable, 
the, the brain actually activates more, right? Which again suggests this, this role of expectations in how we perceive the world and how the brain is processing that information. And this is formalized in mathematical models that explain how the, this might happen uh, from an uh, optimal point of view in a theoretical way. And this have informed a lot of our, our experiments in the laboratory in, in patients. So what this model suggests is that um, essentially the brain forms expectations based on statistical regularities in the environment. And uh, it integrates these expectations with new pieces of information. And it might do so in an optimal way by not only taking into account this piece of information, the context and the new uh, piece of evidence, but seeing how reliable the two pieces of information are and weighting one more or the other one more depending on how reliable they are. So one intuition is that, for instance, uh, if we go to the street right now and we see someone talking by themselves, we might think, we could think that they're having hallucinations, they're talking to themselves, but typically we'll think that they have probably an earpiece, they're talking on the phone to someone else. Uh, so this is quite common right now. But that reflects that we're integrating the prior knowledge that we have with what we're seeing right now. So we're not just taking the new information of this person talking by themselves at face value and in isolation, but we're putting it in the context of our prior knowledge. So we're integrating the context with the new piece of evidence. So that's the type of, of uh, process that I'm talking about. So I'm gonna give you a more concrete example that actually reflects an experiment that we did in the lab. So this is a, a task where you, uh, we ask people to reproduce the duration of different beeps, um, like this. They can play it. So just the beep that has some duration, and we're gonna ask you to reproduce how long that was, okay? And um, sometimes that beep might not be as clear, might have more noise in it, like this one. These are beeps of about 700 milliseconds, and people can reproduce that. The important thing is that we create some context in the task by generate, playing some beeps before the one that we're asking the person to reproduce, like this. So you heard some beeps that are not exactly the same, uh, but they're about, uh, say, 500 milliseconds. And that creates a context that, based on the mechanisms that I was explaining, is gonna be integrated with the new information, which is the last beep that we're gonna ask the person to reproduce. So what this model suggests is that the perceived duration of the beep, or of the last beep, is gonna be somewhere in between the expected uh, duration, based on the context, and the actual duration of the tone that we're asking the person to reproduce. And this is well balanced um, in between the two. But we can also change the context and make it very, very consistent, like this. So maybe in that, uh, it's not as clear, but, but those were beeps that were exactly the same duration after you hear a number of those. Repeatedly, you might for form a very, very concrete expectation and you might have a lot of confidence that the next beep is gonna be exactly the same duration. And that's what's reflected here by this distribution that is narrower because you, you have a better sense of exactly what it's going to be. And in that case, because we have an expectation that we're more confident about, this model would suggest that that's gonna affect more the person, even more. So the person right now is not going to be exactly in between the reality of the last tone that you're supposed to reproduce and the context, but even more biased towards your expectations and further away from reality. So you see there's a balance from uh, your experience being closer to the expectations or closer to reality. And this changes based on how much confidence we have in different sources of information. So what we have seen in the lab in uh, people with schizophrenia is that people with mild or no hallucinations have a pretty well balanced system and their percepts are sort of optimally in between the actual stimulus, the actual beeps and, and the expected durations. But in people uh, with more severe hallucinations, 
we see that their perceptions, their subjective experience of the duration of the beep is more biased towards their expectations, right? So it's further away from reality. And this correlates with how severe their hallucinations of voices are. And this is, I should point, this is uh, with the exact same task, the exact same context, but they're assigning more confidence to the same contextual information. And that is bias in their perception more. And we see that this is related to the sort of uh, dopamine measures that Anissa explained of uh, dopamine in the striatum. So we see that people with more severe hallucinations have more dopamine in the striatum, and people with mild or no hallucinations has, have less dopamine. And these two phenomena are correlated. So this suggests a model, this is an oversimplification, but the idea that too much dopamine in the striatum leads to uh, disproportionate confidence in expectations, and this leads to more biased perception. And this may lead to hallucinations based on our work. And this is uh, still ongoing work, but we're working on this. But we think that this sort of model is important for several reasons. One, we know that, like Anissa also explained, dopamine block most common antipsychotics, or all of them actually, block dopamine at this upstream level here. And we're hoping that it corrects some of these downstream processes. But we know that some people don't respond to antipsychotics and still have hallucinations and other symptoms. And what we want to do is to try to understand these processes better, to try to tackle them directly. And that might be good in the sense that some patients might have a very particular profile of symptoms, for instance, only hallucinations. And we might only want to alter this without changing dopamine in the striatum more generally. So this might lead to a new generation of uh, uh, more targeted improved treatments. The other important thing, like Nissa mentioned, is that we're also trying to develop new non-invasive MRI-based methods to look at this dopamine dysregulation, which is very important in schizophrenia. And Anissa talked about methods uh, that measure dopamine in the synapse at the level of the striatum. Um, with MRI, we can also measure an indirect uh, proxy for this process at the level of where the bodies of those cells are in a part of the brain called the midbrain, in particular in the substantia nigra. And we do this with a technique called neuromelanin-sensitive neuromelanin MRI. Neuromelanin is a product of the metabolism of dopamine, and it accumulates in this part of the brain here in the substantia nigra. And we have seen that the signal with this technique correlates with the amount of dopamine in the striatum measured with PET. Uh, so we think this is important, like Anissa mentioned, because uh, this may provide a non-invasive way of tracking progression of illness and also looking at kids who might be at risk to develop psychosis. And hopefully this will give us a biomarker to see who might develop uh, schizophrenia and perhaps to be able to treat them earlier. We're also doing some work in delusions, in the other type of false uh, delusional beliefs with a similar model. And I don't have time to explain this, but the idea is very similar, it's a similar model. So uh, like I said before, we think this is important because it might be uh, a way to uh, produce new treatments, but also because it might reduce the stigma that is associated with psychosis by casting it in terms of an extreme variant of something that happens to all of us that are just biases in, in perception and the way we think about things. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, my mentor, Anissa Abidargam, and also my previous mentor, Brad Peterson, uh, trainees in the lab who have worked in this, uh, in this projects that I mentioned, a lot of collaborators and colleagues at Columbia and elsewhere, uh, funding sources, of course the patients, and of course PBRF for their outstanding mission and, and their support uh, to young investigators. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.